There she is. Pinto donor. 2014 Cyclone. Okay. She did not know that she was going to become a Pinto, but she is. I can't get it away. <laughs> It is not the Eco Boost version. This is actually the 37 Cyclone, and it's the upgraded rally package. You can see the strut tower brace put in, and then if you look down the side, it's actually got the cool graphics and the little uh, grill vents on the rear opera windows in the back. After weeks and weeks of having to get a key made and cut, because there was no key for this car after, car after it made its way to the junkyard, we finally got a key. And so now we are going to hear it run, make sure that she is indeed a viable donor. And sure enough, 3,641 miles. So once we got the uh, car back to the shop, uh, we did a bunch of measurements on it, checked track width, uh, wheelbase, all of that. Uh, without a ton of fabrication work, none of this stuff on the original Mustang was actually going to work for the Pinto. So we ended up calling up Heights and going with a Mustang 2 style front end and then modifying one of their 67 rear Mustang setups. One, two, one. After a day of fighting through this mess of wires, unplugging everything, it was actually pretty easy. Um, not a whole lot of nut and bolts that had to be removed to get this motor and rear end and everything out of the car, so that worked out pretty nice. We built a little dolly setup makeshift thing for the back of the car so that we could roll it back on the flatbed and get it back to salvage. So this is the reason we took a perfectly good Mustang apart and just destroyed it. Because no matter what we would have done to that Mustang, it is never going to be nearly as cool as this Pinto is going to be with that motor in it. Just think about it. This car out of the factory barely weighed 2,000 pounds. And now we're yanking that heavy motor and tranny out of it and sticking a 350 pound all aluminum 320 horse V6 out of a Mustang in it. Yeah. It's going to be cool. This was a low buck car when it was built in 1978, so to find it in this good a shape almost 50 years later is crazy. This thing is completely unmolested. This guy took it and parked it in his garage 40 some years ago just because it started to rust a little bit and it sat there hoping he would get time to restore it and uh, we ended up talking him out of it. So we're going to grab the kid, get this up on the lift and see what the underside looks like.
So huge surprise, the floors are completely gone. What you're seeing in the picture is really just the bottom of the carpet is kind of rust colored. But all the support, all the bracing, everything was galvanized from the factory. So that seemed to save all of that. It's really good shape. And all of this suspension's getting ripped out and thrown in the junkyard. So we're off to a really good start. So unlike the Mustang, it wasn't just a few bolts to drop this thing out the bottom. It took a little while and then everything pretty well packed up in here. So it took a little bit to get the motor out. But we got her out, got everything all cleaned up, pressure washed the inside of the engine compartment and got ready to start stripping everything else off of it. Most of the rust damage in the car, I think, was caused from water sitting in it while it was stored. There's not a lot of evidence of it on the road up at the wheel wells or anything, just the low spots in the floor. Drains were plugged up, the water just couldn't get out. But you can see the carpet floor that I was talking about. Once we took the carpet out, it just took most of the floor out with it. And they don't make patch panels for a cruising wagon. So we got the bead roller out and replicated all of the original lines of the floor and repatched this thing in so there would be no evidence that it was ever repaired. The good thing about this car was is there isn't a whole lot of layers. It's a unibody, but it's not like the newer cars. They use some decent steel. So there isn't like 15 layers you gotta cut through to do these rust repairs. The bad part was is every time I turned around, I found another little spot that we were gonna have to cut out and replace. So it did take some time. We probably had a week or so, maybe even a little bit more, just get the floors and that back together. And then there's a few little spots that we wanted to fabricate. Um, a few changes, getting rid of the uh, spare tire well in the back for a larger gas tank and that kind of stuff. But about two weeks, you know, somewhere in there, I think we had it pretty well knocked out. Inside of the car all wrapped up, we turned our attention to the outside. I wanted to get some really good measurements of those graphics out there because we're going to reproduce those as close to the factory as possible. And just like any other day in Wisconsin at the body shop, we started working on the rust repairs. And luckily for a car that's been in Wisconsin its whole life, they were pretty minimal. Uh, the bottom of the rear quarters, the wheel arches, a few little holes in the inner fenders, all stuff that we had to make in the shop because they don't make patch panels for any of that stuff, but no one would ever know if this thing ever had any damage. Something I didn't realize when we bought this car, but we started to disassemble it. And believe it or not, those cool side panels on the Pinto Cruising Wagon are simply a piece of sheet metal screwed to the side with some dum-dum on it. They didn't change the drip rails. They didn't change the window openings. They didn't change anything. It's simply a normal Pinto Wagon underneath all that. KBS. And this is after KBS. When I told everybody my plans for the driveline in this Pinto, they thought I was completely insane and I was never going to get this stuff to fit inside that little Pinto engine bay. But half of my drive to do what I do is to prove those people wrong. So we got to work, 
cut the front of the course report out, took a little chunk out of the tunnel to make it easier to get the motor in and out. And then about the 12th or 13th time we plopped it in, the thing fit perfect. The front cross member was gonna have to be removed if we were gonna be able to get that motor in and get around the oil pan and still be able to get the steering rack and everything in there. So we chopped that up, called up Heights, found out that their 34 to 40 Ford cross member for their Mustang II conversion kit was as close as we were gonna to get to the measurements that we needed to get it between the frame rails. So with a little bit of modifying on that, we got that welded in. Motor mounts were pretty simple. Took some quarter inch plate, drilled it out to match the mounting holes on the motor. Used a Summit uh, Universal kit for the actual mounts and then bent up a piece of one and five eighths quarter wall for the saddle to weld everything up to. And now it is where it's going to live forever. So as I mentioned, we had to cut all the suspension in that cross member out of this thing to get the engine to fit. And the 34 to 40 Ford frame rails are square, whereas the subframe on Pinto are not even close. So I did a little bit of research to find out exactly where that top control arm needed to be located and exactly how far forward or back the perch needed to be for the suspension. And then I just started welding it together. There's probably 15 different pieces to gusset that whole frame together up in there and get those perches in the right spot. But once they were cleaned up and painted, it looks like they were built factory. And that's exactly what was always supposed to be in there. Now that we got the uh, coilovers on it, this thing really looks sweet. I ordered a 67 Mustang style four link kit for the back of this car, hoping that it was gonna fit in there. But like everything else with this project, she just was not gonna be happy unless she had something hand fabricated just for her. So while I figured out what I was gonna do with that issue, we decided we'd get the track width set and that meant cutting four inches out of each side of the axle tubes from that 8.8 out of the Mustang and ordering some new axles from Mosier. We decided to scrap most of that four link kit and go back to the three link setup that the 2014 Mustang had in it. And that meant making a third link for the top uh, mount for the tunnel and ordering some coilovers from QA1. Once we got the pan hard bar mocked up and installed in the back, we checked the travel articulation. This thing is going to handle great.
With the spare tire well gone in the back of the car, I now had room for a much larger tank. So we ordered this Nova tank for the rear end. It's from Holly. It's got the inset fuel pump, so it's nice and quiet. And it keeps us from exploding if we're ever rear-ended. I figured as far as cooling went, Ford already had it figured out, so I just needed to make the original radiator fit that the Mustang had in it. Okay, so it wasn't quite that simple, but compared to the exhaust, that was nothing. I had to figure out how to fit all of these one and three quarter inch header pipes through a one and a half inch hole, and then keep it from not overheating my transmission or scraping on the ground every time we hit a speed bump. Hating to hide a set of headers anyway, I decided the best thing to do, and the coolest looking thing to do, would be to build the headers upside down shove them right in your face and shoot them right out the inner fender which gave me all kinds of room and the option to throw some turbos on it at some point if I wanted to now the original thought on this exhaust was once I got through the inner fender and under the car I could just run a standard two inch exhaust straight out the back it sound nice. Then I came across a picture of old 62 Corvette side pipes on it. And being that the pipe was already sitting right there in front of that front door, it was kind of a no-brainer. Unfortunately, every time I bring up this subject, I meet quite a bit of resistance from the wife. But I gave her one more shot, and believe it or not, she thought it was the coolest freaking idea she had ever heard. Getting close to the finishing stages of mock-up, just about time to bring this thing over to the paint side so it can look nice and pretty. But I still need to chop the bottom of these front doors off, get those repaired and rebuilt, rebuilt the hatch area, the latches on that, and then I really need to figure out what I'm going to do about that hood. Because even though I said the engine fit, it doesn't really quite fit. And the last thing I want to do is cut a hole and stick some big ugly plastic scoop on the thing make it look like a drag car or look like some teenager just put something on there to be cool so i'm going to do some research amy's going to keep on priming these parts and we're going to figure out what our options are We decided to install what we like to call here a speed hump. It's not really a scoop, it makes the car look really fast without looking really cheap. So we cut the hole in the hood, cut about 90% of this scoop down, got everything welded into place, set it on top of the car and it did not disappoint. And now that we got the rest of the front end of the car mocked up, this thing looks really cool. I cannot wait until we get the paint on it.